Good morning. We are looking at Wednesday morning on the um, 16th uh, of uh, September. Now, I missed Monday, so I apologize for those who uh, were looking for a devotional on Monday. I had some dental work done on the front of my uh, mouth and my teeth and my nose and the front part of upper part of my lip and stuff didn't come alive until later in the morning when I was on to some other parts of my schedule. Uh, so uh, let's uh, catch up to where we were and, and move ahead. We are doing a devotional in the book of Jude. We're working through it uh, exegetically, but also devotionally so that we can um, be encouraged by it and, uh, and exhort it to follow some of the uh, implications of it in our lives. I think it's pertinent to what's going on in these days of COVID um, virus and the challenges that are before the church. Do we meet in a building? Do we defy uh, government authorities that are trying to uh, protect the overall community uh, and especially the vulnerable in the community uh, from the virus and overwhelm our medical systems? Uh, or is all of it a subversive plot to uh, take away our faith and freedom as uh, believers in Jesus Christ and Christians by not letting us uh, worship together the way we would choose and uh, want to in a corporate gathering? So there's a lot of uh, opinions, if you will, coming from all different angles. And I have expressed some of those over the last number of months, since last April, actually, when we had our beginning lockdown and I began these devotionals and worked on characters uh, of our walk in Christ as faith and trust. Um, and uh, I believe that Jude's exhortations to the people he was writing to uh, have a lot of application for you and I in our own struggles today. Now, we don't know uh, specifically what group Jude was writing to. We do know that they are those who are uh, called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. And that certainly applies to each and every child of God throughout all the generations of history until the Lord comes back. Quite likely he was addressing uh, believers in the Palestine area, in, in Jerusalem and the surrounding area, uh, given his opening statement that he's a servant or a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, if James uh, is the elder of the Jerusalem church and the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ and one of the more um, highly respected leaders of the church. Uh, in that day in the first century. His identification with him would give a legitimacy and a weight to his letter and writing. Um, and so quite likely that would be it. But others would have known about James uh, in the broader area. The letter was most uh, well accepted in uh, Egypt and that around Alexandria area. So it's quite likely he could have been writing to believers there too. Uh, in any case, it becomes a very beautiful and uh, exhorting letter to all believers throughout uh, the history of the church. We're going to focus in, because we've covered the opening of it in previous devotions, in verse 3 and 4. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our Lord, of our God, into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. There is a strong, strong encouragement and exhortation to contend. And, and I, I uh, 
I see in this letter from my own heart as I look at it, uh, a pastor heart out of Jude. Um, he says he was going to write to them about a common salvation. It was, I think, initially in his heart to write an encouraging letter about uh, our salvation in Jesus Christ, the benefits, I would believe, and all that is there. And as he contemplated writing this letter to encourage the brothers and sisters in Christ that he's writing to, he says he found it necessary to write appealing to contend for the faith. So it, it ups the game. He, he's um, looking to encourage, and all of a sudden he is uh, warning and giving a call to arms, to action. He's basically saying we need to get in there and contend and get ready to fight for the faith, the Christian faith, which has already been delivered to us. So we know that this is a little farther down the line in time from the beginning of the church. He will make reference later as we go through to what the apostles has already delivered. It's in a sense of past tense. Um, and so there's an established doctrine of faith for the church. And, uh, and he sees this being undermined and attacked. And as he addresses that, um, his focus is going to center in on false teachers. He says in verse 4, for certain people have crept in unnoticed. I want to read a few scriptures from 2 Peter, which uh, most likely drew upon Jude's letter. Uh, it, from the reading that I did, uh, I would be more inclined with those uh, very scholarly people who placed Jude's letter before 2 Peter and, and uh, arguments, different ones for the different places where to put it seemed reasonable to me. Uh, but in any event, they do coincide. Uh, in 2 Peter 2, verse 1, he starts out, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. And then again in Second uh, Peter chapter 3, he uh, comes back into this same thing again. And in verse 3, he starts out, Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of these the world that then existed were, was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word the heavens and earth now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of of the ungodly. So Peter is warning also, like Jude, that there was a um, predictions and warnings that men would come, teachers, false teachers would come, introducing destructive teachings that would attack Jesus Christ, the Master and Lord of his church. And certainly that's what we do find then in Jude as he opens up in his epistle um, here where it says I found it necessary to write appealing for you to contend for the faith he's not telling them to contend for the faith 
against the attack of the world. The persecution of the world against the church is to be accepted, should not be a shock for any of us. Um, but the world in its persecution will not seek to undermine and destroy our faith. It will seek to undermine and destroy us, uh, but not, not our faith. It hasn't the power to do that unless uh, we abandon our, our convictions. But what he's worrying about is those who have crept in, hidden in the church, who appear to be uh, true believers in the church, says they've crept in, certain people unnoticed, meaning that they made their way among us, but we didn't realize that they were of a danger. And they are teachers in the church. They've been uh, elevated to a place of teaching. And now they are in danger of subverting the faith. Those are the ones. So it's an internal uh, contending for truth. And he, he doesn't, as uh, we'll find as we go through, tell us to attack these men, but to know who they are and, and to not be drawn into their error, drawing into their destructiveness, their ungodliness. So we're in a fight within the church. That part really resonates with me and what's going on today. There's so many, especially with social media, something Jews obviously have no concept of whatsoever. But there is so much that people can uh, get out there in the form of teaching um, and declare um, this is what they think is truth. And the interesting thing about Jude is he doesn't zero in on the teaching. He focuses in on the false teachers and he focuses in on their character. And as we see, we're going to go through, he exposes who they are in character, in nature. And no matter what they are teaching, their nature, their character of who they are, is what uh, needs to be made aware of and needs to be concerned about. Now, that's also more of a danger in the era of social uh, media and internet and YouTube and, and all the different medias because uh, it's easy to lose the personal connection. I pastor Communion Life Fellowship. I pastor at Communion Life Fellowship. I think around 34 years, we might be coming up on 35. I'd have to sit down and figure it out. Um, but, you know, if you have pastored a body of people for over 30 years, the character and nature, they know my flaws. I mean, it, my shortcomings and my failures, you, you can't hide those for 30 years. Um, and, and yet, uh, hopefully, they would also know my heart and my desire to serve God and my willingness to repent when I, I realize where I'm off and screwed up and whatnot and getting back on track. But there's an ability to know who I am. There's an ability to know what I'm like as a husband, what I'm like as a father, what I'm like as a grandfather. Um, and... Uh, I don't have to be the greatest teacher in the world. I have to be truthful and honest to, and, and diligent in my study to produce what God has wanted me to produce. But uh, unlike many people on social media, you have no way of knowing their character. Uh, the exposing of uh, Jerry Falwell Jr., in a lot of what went on in, in Liberty University um, is, I believe, an example, a present-day example of what's going on. Um, he felt his money that he raised for the university, for the work that it was doing, justified um, the shortcomings in his Christian character. And uh, Jude's writing... I believe, says that our Christian character is 
primary as leaders and teachers in the church and for those who sit under teachers and, and observe them. The Christian character of those men is primary and their teaching is to be judged according to the scriptures and their character is to be judged according to the scriptures. And so when, when uh, we see Jude writing, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. It's because certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for the condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and, and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we saw how Peter warned that these people were, were the false teachers would come. We also know that Paul warned the Ephesian church that when he left, wolves would come in. And, and that means wolves in the sense of uh, who disguising themselves as sheep to destroy the body. There would be false apostles who are really servants of Satan, but uh, they come in deceptively as uh, angels of light when actually they're angels of darkness. There is always within the church this mix. Jesus' parable talked about seed being sown and an enemy sowing bad seed in the church and it grows up together. Um, the church has a mix within it and discernment uh, and active contending needs to be done for what's right. And let me just finish with this, this comparison. We'll take up with this on Friday. He has uh, those ungodly people pervert the grace of our God into sensuality or licentiousness, loose moral life standard, using the grace of God as a justification for it, and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. I don't necessarily think they were getting up and saying Jesus is not Lord. I think their teaching of a loose standard by the uh, a loose grace, a grace that doesn't have holiness incorporated into it, was a uh, denial of Master and Lord of, uh, of Jesus Christ. It's not a it's a call to submission to lordship. It's not a call to legalism. So the opposite of licentious grace or loose grace is not legalistic holiness. What Jude, I think, is encouraging is uh, submission to true lordship because true submission and obedience to the lordship of Jesus Christ will produce godliness and holiness in your lives that we will produce fruits of holiness fruits of righteousness by that submission to christ and i think that's kind of the the uh, makeup of uh, this last part that i just read to you and that's where we're going to take up on on monday we're going to be looking at this licentious grace and the lordship and then we're going to look at how jude unfolds the character of these men uh, not the theology, but the character, and how we need to take heart that uh, character is important. Uh, the character uh, of our uh, leaders in the church, the characters of leaders in the world, is not separate from their life doctrine, whether it's church doctrine or political doctrine or scientific doctrine. Uh, there, we cannot separate character from belief and conviction uh, because that's not the way God created us as human beings. So uh, I'm going to leave you with that. Hopefully that'll uh, wet your whistle a little bit. Uh, check back on Friday morning for my devotional and have a great day.